All right, so in Ezekiel chapter 22, I'm going to be focusing on, on the last two verses here, of course, real famous uh, verses in this passage. But leading up to these last two verses in Ezekiel 22, of course, we see a really bad report of Israel and a bad state of affairs at this time. You know, we're not going to reread everything, of course, but uh, there's just a lot of bad things that are going on, a lot of wickedness. And what you see here, even in verse number 26, says, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither they show difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profane among them. And, you know, people go off and just spout in the name of the Lord when God hasn't said. And there's just all this different stuff going on. And what's, you know, so it's, it's really, there's a lot of bad things going on. And it, and it gets to the point where God says here in verse number 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and, and stand in the gap before me for the land. So God's like, I'm getting ready to rain down some destruction on this land. I'm getting ready to judge. But before he judges, he's like, you know what? I just want to check and make sure. Is there anyone that's willing to stand up and stand in the gap? And say, you know what, God, don't destroy this land. Someone that can intercede. Someone that can say, God, I'll have integrity. I'll take your word. I'll go to this people. And I'll try to stay the punishment that's coming because of all the wickedness. And unfortunately, it says, you know, it says here, standing up before me that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none. And what's interesting about this is just that God said I sought for a man. A man. Oftentimes, that's all God is looking for is for one person. See, we have a great God. God is, God is huge and powerful and almighty, and he's able to do everything, but he's looking for us. He's looking for humans. He's looking for one person sometimes just to say, here am I, Lord, send me. Here I am. God, I'm gonna, I love you. I'm going to serve you. Everyone else may not be, but you know what? I care enough about this land. I care enough about those people, and I care enough about you to stand in the gap and, and be willing to, to offer up myself a living sacrifice to say, here I am. I want to do what you would have me to do. I want to serve you, O Lord. And this concept of finding one person and the, the, the importance and the value that you have as an individual is found all throughout the scripture. And this is great because, you know, as people, you know, as a person living in a world with billions of people, when you just think about how, when you just take a step back and think like, man, there's all these people, you could, you might have a, a thought of, well, who am I? Right? There's all these people and there's all these great leaders, or you know, there's no great leaders, but there's all these people there that have all this fame and, and you know, uh, attention and that might have more positions of authority. It's kind of like, well, well, who am I? But the great thing about our God, about the God of the Bible, the God, the only true God, is that he knows everything about you. He actually loves you tremendously. And he knows so much about each and every one of us. The Bible says that, you know, that the hairs of our head are all numbered. And he knows us so personally and intimately. You know, he's the one who forms and fashions us in the womb. He's the one who's created every single one of us. He's the one that's there to hear our prayers. And I mean, it's, it's hard to fathom that. I mean, imagine the, the volume of prayers going up to the Lord, but it's no big deal for him. And he's able to personally deal with every single one of us. And we have a special place with God. I mean, even Jesus Christ himself gave a great example of, of when he said to his disciples, you know, Satan had desired to have you, but I have prayed for thee. And, he, and he's praying specifically and has, and has particular attention to even one person. You know, in this case, in that case, the apostle Peter, but you know, with each and every single one of us, God has paid personal attention. Jesus Christ paid personal attention and paid for every single one of your sins. You know, it's easy to lump in the, you know, the sins of the whole world, but then apply that to you specifically, that your specific sins that you've done, he took and he bear those for you on the tree. He's the one that took that in himself. So he knows intimately, you know, what he had to do to save your soul. And he did that for everyone. And oftentimes, the, the, you know, besides just having that comfort of knowing that we have a God that knows us and cares about us, even though we're just one of billions, is, is great and amazing. But even beyond that, the ability to be able to serve our God, to, to be able to be used of our God, no matter what condition you're in, even the most lowly of people, you don't have to have 
anything. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have any particular standing to serve God. God is willing to use anyone who's willing to be used of God. And in, in Ezekiel, turn if you would to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going to see a very similar statement to what we see in Ezekiel 22. In Ezekiel 22, he's like, I'm just looking for one person. I just want one person to stand. He say, well, I don't think that I'm that, you know, I can make that much of a difference. I don't think I can make that much of an impact. Well, had you been around here in Ezekiel 22 and you just would have been like, I'll do it, Lord. That could have made all of the difference in the world for Israel. Because that, the last verse in that chapter, when he wasn't able to find anyone, says, Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, said the Lord God. One person could have meant the difference between God pouring out his indignation and his fiery wrath upon them and then that not happening. And even today, God is looking for people, individuals, to, to be able to stand and, and stand firm and fill in the gap. Look at verse number 7 of 2 Chronicles chapter 16. The Bible reads, And at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Assyria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. And of course, Asa, the background of Asa, he was he started off a, a really good king doing the right things. He trusted in the Lord and he had these great victories when they were greatly outnumbered and these huge hosts. But then later in life, he stops trusting in the Lord. and He goes look into an arm of flesh and, and, and just completely does, you know, kind of loses his faith, so to speak. In, in trusting in God uh, for, for their safety. But, um, and, and, and here's where the Lord's kind of, in, you know, explaining to him, hey, the Ethiopians and Lubans had a huge host, but you had faith and I came through for you and I delivered you as promised, as you know that I will. But he explains in verse nine, and this is the most important part. This is a verse I really wanted to focus on. Uh, teaching the same concept as in Ezekiel, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. So God's eyes, the Bible says here, they're running to and fro throughout the whole earth. Not just even in Israel, right, at this time. He's not just looking, he's looking everywhere. The eyes of the Lord are looking through the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. He wants to find the people. He, that, that's why, you know, we don't believe that God's a racist. We do believe that God has replaced the nation of Israel when they rejected him, when they, when they stopped worshiping the Lord, when they turned to idols, when they rejected ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when God finally said, you know what? I'm going to take it from you and give it to a nation producing the fruits thereof. When you could find people who are going to show themselves strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. The people who want to serve the Lord, he said, that's who I'm going to use. He doesn't care if you're physically from the loins of Abraham or not. He wants to serve, he wants his people, people who are born again, people who are saved, people who are known as his people, who's going to be faithful and who's going to faithfully serve him. And that's who he's going to use then to show himself strong on their behalf. And God likes using, you know, you say, well, I'm, I don't, what do I have to offer? You've got a lot. And you know, actually the less that you have to offer, the better it is for you to be used of God because that's going to bring even more glory unto the Lord. Right. And, you know, this wasn't in my notes, but I'll bring this up, especially because earlier, um, you know, I made the comment of, of if God could use someone like me to do anything, then God could use you too. But just a little bit of, if, if for anyone who doesn't know me that well or, or hasn't heard my own personal testimony, um, you know, to get to give God more glory and credit and honor for me even be able to stand up here in front of a group of people is, in my opinion, a miracle in itself because I've always been very shy and not good at public speaking whatsoever to the point of, of being physically ill 
if I would have had to stand in front, and, and my wife can attest to this because I did it one time right after we first got married at some tea party event and, and I stood behind the mic and there's people there and immediately I had to go home and my guts were just killing me and I couldn't stand it. It was, I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Okay. And this is, this is even after getting over the fears of like knocking on a stranger's door to preach the gospel because that was hard enough. Okay. So to get from that point of, of, of fear and, and, you know, uncomfortable. I'm not someone who is just this great orator, and I know I'm still not, but someone to be able to stand up and, and even say any coherent thoughts in front of people because I was terrified of it. But when you allow God to work in your life and when you're willing to say, you know what, I can see this in scripture and I can see this is something that God would have me to do. And, and, and you know what, I, I'm not that good at it, God, but, but you know, I, I want to do the best I can do. I'm going to put myself out here just to say, however you want to use me, Lord, you can use me. And that's, that's the power of, of the individual that God can use one particular individual to do a lot of great things. And, and, but you have to be willing. You have to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm willing to, I'm willing to do this, Lord. I love you and I want to do this. And let God use you. I can't take any credit for even being able to come up here because it, I, 100% it's God being able to, to give me the boldness and to help me and prepare me to be able to do anything, even being able to speak in front of a group of people. Um, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I'd reference this, bro this passage in my sermon this morning. And when you hear me fumbling with my words, it's because I don't have the natural talent. So, <laughs> so just forgive me for that. Just being able to, to, to speak clearly is, is, is a miracle. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Don't worry about what you have to offer God. Because ultimately, God doesn't need what you have. If he's going to use you, he can use you just like just like he made you. How about that? Yeah. Just like when Moses was was complaining when, when he was selected and chosen, hey, God, want, God, I got a job for you, Moses. You're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to lead this people free, and you you know, and you're going to be this prophet, and you're and you're going to lead people out. And he's like, well, I can't speak that good, God. I, I mean, I, I can't do this. And obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but God's like, look, I'm the one who made your tongue. Yeah. He knew he could do it, but God, of course, graciously allowed for Aaron to, to get involved and, and, and everything, but um, Moses was completely capable, and we see Moses many times without Aaron's assistance at all, completely capable of doing and leading and doing everything that he needed to do anyways, right? God gave him a little bit of extra support, say, okay, Aaron could go with you, but he really didn't need that because God knew better than Moses even knew. And whatever it is that you might think might be preventing you or holding you back from doing more, from being able to serve the Lord more, from, from whatever it is, whatever area it is that you may have been hesitant to get involved with, and it can be anything. There's all kinds of different ways to serve the Lord. Um, but start with soul winning, go to, to, to singing, preaching, whatever, right? All the different things that you may have some personal reason to say, oh, I don't think I could really do that or you know, I, I don't, I don't think I can. Sing. How about singing? I don't think I could sing that well. I can't sing that well. But you know what? I led the singing for years at Faith Bar. <laughs> I still lead the singing sometimes in my church. God's not as interested in in how well you can sing. Now, I do believe you should try your best, give it your all. But at the end of the day, God's the one who made your vocal cords, and He want what He wants to hear more is you making a joyful sound unto the Lord with what he gave you, than you saying, oh, well, I don't want other people to not, you know, to have to hear my voice. God wants to hear your voice. Don't worry about other people. You can do it. And God wants to use you in, in, in every capacity, in all those ways. So First um, Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start reading here in verse number 26. The Bible reads, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, 
But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. See, God likes to use the people who don't have the natural ability and all the natural talents and all the, the things that you could say, oh, well, of course he's able to do that because he's just already, you know, I think of Samson, I think a lot of people have this tendency to think that Samson was like this huge bodybuilder, you know, these big muscles and stuff. And that's how the cartoons portray him. I don't think he's like that at all. I honestly don't think, we don't see that anywhere in scripture. He had a lot of muscles. You know, the reason why he was able to tear the, the, the bars of the gates and, and take them with him is because he had the power, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. He was able to do these things. He was able to, to beat all the, the enemies and, and, and win all those battles and do everything that he did because it was under the power of God. And he had these powers, this power given to him. It's not, it's not because he was just pumping iron every day. Seriously, because that, that would be, because then where's the miracle in that? How is God going to get the glory in the strength of Samson if it's just completely like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, he just, he's, it's, it's like Goliath, right? God didn't use a giant to kill a giant. God used this, you know, a, a ruddy youth yeah. to kill a giant. Why? Because God gets so much more glory and credit and honor because he's using something that in, in the fleshly mind is impossible. That's why when, God, when you know, God's happy to win those big battles, those big victories for the children of Israel. You could read all throughout the Kings and the Chronicles of all the battles that they fought and, and how many times they were outnumbered. And you know what? God wins the victories. Or David's mighty men. God gets the credit for those victories. Yeah, you know, they were mighty because they were putting themselves out there, but their faith was in God to win those victories. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God doesn't need the, you know, the, the who is it, the, the Neil deGrasse Tysons and the Bill Nyes or whoever the, the egghead, you know, uh, brainiacs are out there. He doesn't need the, the, the Hawkings. He doesn't need those people. To, to be the preachers and to show that, that the Bible's true. He doesn't need that. He has his word, which bears witness and testifies, but he just needs anyone who's willing to say, here I am, God, I'm willing to do whatever you have me to do and, and to be able to get that much more glory because he doesn't want flesh, of verse 29 says, that no flesh should glory in his presence. In Judges chapter 6, you could, you could flip there if you'd like. I'll read for you from 1 Samuel 9. We have two examples I'm, that I'm going to show you real quick about men who were greatly used of God, just mightily used of God, but have very humble backgrounds. And, and, and basically, if they were just left to their own devices, left to their own pedigree, they wouldn't be looked to as being leaders at all in the flesh. But because God decided to use them, he was able to lift them up and promote them and honor them and have them do mighty things because God was involved. Uh, Judges chapter 6, verse number 12, this is about Gideon, right? What I mean, who doesn't know the story of Gideon? The sword of the Lord of Gideon, right? And the great battle and the victory that Gideon made. What a great hero of the faith Gideon is. But look at his beginning. Look at verse number 12. Judges chapter 6, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. See, this is how God sees the man. He didn't see himself this way. Other people didn't see Gideon this way. But God, the, this, this angel's already projecting this from, from the Lord. Hey, you're a mighty man of valor. He's hiding things from the Midianites. He doesn't want to be seen. He's not really bold. He, I'm sure he's not seeing himself as a mighty man of valor, but the Lord knows what he wants to do with him, and the Lord wants to use him, and he knows that he's going to accept. Look at verse number 13. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now 
the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And again, going back to just the concept of the individual, look at how many times he says thou and thee in verse number 14. Go in this thy might, go in your strength, and you, thou, shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And you're going to do this, Gideon. You're going to go and fight. You're going to win this battle. You're going to bring deliverance. Because God wanted to send him. And in verse 15, he says, And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. You know, my whole household, we're poor. We're not esteemed. We're not the rulers. We're not in charge of anything. We're just this poor family in Manasseh. And you know what? Me personally, I'm like the least in the entire household. So who, why are you coming to me? Shouldn't you be going to some other family, some nobleman, some, some other group of people there and, and pick the best and the brightest? Why are you coming to me, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, verse 16, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Because that's all you need. If God be for us, who could be against us? Because through Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. You plus God, I mean, take it, bring anyone on. And that's the, the, the encouragement of knowing that God is, and I believe, still looking for individuals to serve him in mighty ways. And so much good can be done if one person is just willing to say, okay, I'll do what you have me to do. Now, it's not an easy task that's set before him. He's got to go, like, wage war. I think one of the reasons why there's so many people not willing to take it on is because, one, they're going to be trusting in themselves. Like he's saying here, you know, I'm... I'm who am I? I'm a nobody. I can't do anything. You want me to do this great thing? I don't know anything about that. I'm not some man of war. He's calling me a man of war, but I don't know anything about this. And besides, I don't want to go off and lead some battle. I'd lead some fight. You know, I'd rather just stay here and, and keep on keeping on doing what I'm doing. And when everybody has that attitude and things are going bad, then you get what happens in Ezekiel 22. I saw it for a man. And there's nobody. No one is willing to stand up. Thankfully, here, Gideon is willing. He hears, whoa, I could do that? You're going to be with me? He had the faith to go and do, and, and of course, now everybody knows Gideon's name. Everyone knows the great things that God did through Gideon. Saul is another example of this, 1 Samuel 9, 21. You don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus 26. 1 Samuel 9, Verse 21, the Bible says, And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? That's, a, that's King Saul, before you know, as he's being selected to become king, saying, why, why me? Same background, basically saying, you know, the tribe of the Benjamites were the smallest tribe. At this time he's saying, and I'm least in my father's house, and we're just this poor family. Like, why, why me? Because God likes to be able to use people who have nothing, who don't, who don't have their own fleshly might and wisdom to offer, and God's going to be able to use you and say, you know what, you're the perfect person. And you're sitting here today going, I don't have anything to offer God, then you are a prime candidate to be used mightily of God, but you have to be willing. You have to be willing to say, I will do what you would have me to do, Lord, and actually mean it and actually follow through with it. Right, and not just give the lip service because, oh yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I want I want to be on the receiving end of the glory, but no, you got to go through the hard times first. All it takes is for one person to offer themselves up a living sacrifice to the Lord. God will use the small and weak to raise up a mighty leader through the power of God. And what we see here in Leviticus 26, where I had you turn to, is we see this exponential effect of having more than one person joined together in obedience to God. And this is awesome. When you start getting more than one person, 
You know, it's great when you have one person to be a trailblazer. You've got one person to stand the gap. You've got one person to be that leader. You've got that Jeremiah. You've got that Ezekiel. You've got that one prophet that's willing to say, hey, I don't care if everyone's against me. I'm going to stand up. But then how much better is it when you start getting a group of people together to follow that leader? And what's awesome here is you've got a great leader here in Illinois that's willing to stand up and have integrity and say, I'm just going to stand on the word of God. And we're going to do mighty things and we're going to reach a lot of people. And God's saying, great, I could use that person. And then the more people you start getting together and saying, you know what? Yeah, I want to join up. I want to be part of this. I want to use this. Look at the, look at the exponential impact and power that, that God gives the, when you have even just still a small number of people that can band together. In uh, Leviticus 26, verse number three, just to give the context, he says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, and he continues on to list off all these great blessings and things that he's going to do for you. And then in verse number seven, he says, and you shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred and an hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. So he's saying, with me on your side, all you, you got five people, you're going to be able to, to chase a hundred people away. 20 to one. For every 20 of them, it only takes one of you to be able to chase away a, a 20 of them. And then even further, you get 100 people together, you're going to put 10,000 to flight. That's awesome. That's amazing that God is able to do that, but he is. And this is, this is the capability. This is the potential that God has for you to be able to do great things. Now, obviously, we're not having physical battles. We're not looking to pick up swords and arms and, and go off and chase you know, a thousand, ten thousand people, whatever, with a sword. Obviously, we can take these great truths, though, and apply them spiritually. And and how much more than now do we need to have the 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 army of light that people are willing to stand up and stand forth for the truth and righteousness? And how much good can just a few people do? You can do a lot of good. God can use you to shine the light into a dark. In, in perverted world and you know we may be we may very well be in the last days but i look at it this way the book of daniel says that they're going to do great exploits that the saints are going to do great exploits in the last days and you know what if we are heading if, if that's where we are and i kind of tend to think that we are but i you know obviously i don't know for sure but the way things are ramping up we need now more than ever People who are going to, to make the decision and make the choice in their heart and say, you know what? I'm going to stand. I'm going to do what's right. Lord, I want to be used of you. Help me to do what's right and, and start moving forward. Because you can have a huge impact in this spiritual battle that we are engaged in right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. You say, I have that heart and I have that attitude and I want to be used of God. What do I do? I'm here. Well, it starts with understanding what we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is the importance of your place within a church, within a body of believers. Because what God designed, especially in the New Testament, is the local independent church where you have Christ at the head, right? Christ should be the one that's, that's guiding and directing and where you get all of your direction from in this church that comes directly from Jesus Christ. Underneath that, you've got your pastor and then you've got all the rest of the members of the church in particular. And that church is a body. Every church is a body with Jesus as the head and then the body being made up of all of the members. And in order for a body to function properly, you need to have every member in its place doing the things that God has designed and wants for everyone to be doing. And, and, and this will become a little bit more clear as we read the passage. Let's just look at verse number 12 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one spirit are we all baptized, excuse me, into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? So basically what we're seeing here is it's likening the body of Christ with an actual physical body. And in a physical body, you have a lot of different members, a lot of different body parts that make up one whole body. You've got fingers and eyes and ears and nose, right? And every single different part of your body has a different purpose and a different function. And if you had a body that was just all noses, right? And there's like no ears, no eyes, like, well, how are you going to see? How are you going to hear? All you're going to do is smell. You know, that's, a, that's, that's not a very well-equipped body. You're only able to do one thing, right? You're not going to be very successful in doing a lot of work for, for anybody because you can only do that one thing. Obviously, a body is capable of doing a lot of different things. And you can't say, well, because I'm not the eye, then I, I don't even need to be part of the body. That's ridiculous and that's silly, right? People have a tendency to look at certain jobs within a church, within a group, and say, well, if I can't, be th can't have this job, then, then what good is it? Oh, Someone else is already the piano player. Someone else already does this, so I can't have anything else I could do. No. There's, there's other things to do. And you know what we need to do is be going to God and seeing where, does, where would God have you to fit in. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. God's the one who builds the body. And I firmly believe that God is the one who builds every single one of his local churches. And he's the one who brings the members together. And just by you being here and being in this church, God has a place for you. You have a job and a function that you can be doing within this body. And if you say, well, I don't really do anything, you need to start being useful and become a useful member of the body. You know, I hate the attitude that people have these days. And I'm not saying it's, it's, it's in this church, but just in general out in the world where people kind of evaluate churches going, well, what can you do for me? What programs do you have? What kids' programs do you have? Well, what different service times do you have? Well, do you, I mean, do you offer any kind of assistance? And just this, this like interview process of, well, you know what? Maybe this isn't the right church for you because, you know, the, the, the right attitude of someone who's coming to church should not be, what can you do for me? It's what can I do to serve? The whole point of, of coming to church. This is, this is a ministry, right? What does it mean to be in a ministry? It means you minister. You're ministering to others. Now, you do come and receive from a minister of the word of God who's going to teach and train and do his best to equip you. But at the same time, you're there to minister to others and to minister amongst each other within the church and, and fill a role and do a job that, that God has for you. We're all here to serve. We're called as servants. Jesus Christ gave us the greatest example of being a servant. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. So he could show us what it's like to be a servant. And if the Son of God can come down and leave his glory in heaven and wash his disciples' feet, then who are we to say that, oh, no, I'm not coming to church to serve anybody? Are you crazy? Let's follow the example. You want to say you're, follow, you're a follower of Christ, you're a Christian? Then how about we actually follow him? He led by example. He always put everyone before himself. You think he wasn't tired when he was going out and ministering to people and preaching to people and not getting any sleep because he's going up in a mountain to pray all night? And then he's getting up the next day and going out. What is he doing? Working more, giving, giving, giving. Oh, healing people here, giving of himself. And you know... I, for those of you who don't really preach, or if you haven't preached the gospel, even just preaching the gospel, like, it's tiring. You spend some time out there, even when it's not, you know, hot and humid and everything, you can have the perfect conditions. When you go out and you preach, and you're preaching the gospel, there is something that's just physically draining about it, that unless you do it, it's hard to understand. You think, what's the big deal? I've talked for hours before. It's not the same. It's not the same. 
It is spirit. You're, you are doing spiritual work when you're preaching God's word and you're preaching the gospel to people. It's not the same as just having a conversation with someone. And I can't fully explain it to you, but I hear a lot of, yes, that's, that's right. That's true. Because you know it's true. But that's only one area where God has for you to serve. And, and within a church, there's many areas. And you need to start asking yourself, well, what can I do? What, what abilities, what gifts has God given me? How can I serve others? And there's so many ways of doing that. You can, and if you have any questions on that, he's the man to ask right there. I'm sure he's got plenty of things lined up that he wants to do that you can help with. And, um, you know, having a church that's running like a well-oiled machine is going to be able to get a lot more done for the kingdom of God. You could reach so many more people. I, I mean, I know for myself, I've got all kinds of different ideas and plans and things I want to do with our church, but it's just a matter of, of having enough manpower to do it. Because there's so many things that we can do, but we need to have everybody working together in concert and having the idea that, no, I'm not here just for about me, me, me. It's about everybody else. Now, as exciting as it is and how great it is, how much work God can do and how, and how many great things can be done through an individual, right? And how many great victories and, and the amount of, that can be accomplished, the power and the influence that one person can possess can be used for good, but can also be used for evil. So when you have these great opportunities and when you have great responsibility to serve the Lord, that also comes with great risk, right? With your opportunity comes a risk and with your responsibility also comes a potential for um, doing evil and danger too. So we need to be aware of this. I brought up the example of King David, right? King David was used, one man, to bring a great victory for the children of Israel when he defeated Goliath. When he had the faith in God to say, you know, you come to me with, with a staff and a shield and a sword, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, right? And he comes to him, and, and he's able to, to kill that giant because he's trusting in God to deliver him. And, and what a great victory, right? Amen. That shows that great power. But at the same time, one man also, David, did a lot of damage yeah. through then his own sin. Right. How about when he numbered the children of Israel? You know, that caused the death of 70,000 people in Israel. 70,000 people died as a result of the sin of one man. So, yes, I want you to get excited about being used of God. Because it is exciting. And because God can use every single one of you individually to do great things for him. But at the same time, realize and remember that with that ability to do great things, there's also a, a, an ability to do a lot of damage, which is why it's all the more important to stay right as uh, I was kind of preaching on this morning. Now, in um, turn, if you would, to James chapter 3. It's the last place I'll have you turn this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 18, the Bible says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. All it takes is one sinner to just bring a lot of destruction. In Ecclesiastes 10, verse number 1, which is basically the next verse, if, if you got rid of all the chapter divisions, the Bible reads, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to stand forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So what does that mean? That means... You know, you, you, the ointment of the apothecary is something that's going to smell real beautiful. It's something that's really nice, right? It's put together that you'd anoint yourself with, and, and it's like a perfume, right? But all it takes is a few dead flies in that to rot and to cause it to stink that all of a sudden you don't want to have that anywhere near your body, right? Like, oh, I'm not going to put that on me because it stinks. Well, similarly, someone who has a great reputation, They've done a lot for the Lord. They, you know, they, they, they've worked real hard and, and maintained this great reputation. It only takes a little bit of folly to completely destroy that reputation. So we need to be careful. 
with our reputation, with our walk, with our testimony. Because it takes a lot to build a good testimony. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of just consistency and integrity and just day after day, staying at it, staying faithful. But watch out because you can do, you can do a lot of great things. You have that testimony. You can do so many great things. God can use you more and more and more every day as you're this vessel that's meat for his use. You've been, you've been cleaning out sin. God's using you more and more and more. You can do so many great things. But beware, because it just takes a little folly. It just takes one screw up to then stink like dead flies in the ointment. Yep. All right. And you start all the way back down yep. at the bottom. And I think the, especially in the, in the day and time that we live in, well, that's why we, we turn to James chapter 3. Because one of the easiest places to ruin reputations and to destroy testimonies literally comes from people's mouths. Yeah. On the one hand, that's the source of some of the best things. You preaching the word of God, right? How, they, how shall they hear except there's a preacher, right? You, you need a preacher to preach the word of God and to get people saved. Preaching the word of God, using your mouth, you can do so many wonderful, great things. You can have so much influence on people's lives. But at the same time, the wrong words, the things that come out of your mouth can do so much damage as well. And James 3 describes it very well, much better than I ever could. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So just that statement alone shows us how difficult it is to really control your mouth and your words. Because if you're able to offend not in word, I was saying, you're a perfect man. And you're able to control, I mean, you can control every other part of your body. If you can control your mouth, you can control everything. And then verse 3 says, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listens. So this is talking about two different areas that it's real, it's a real small tool is required for, for great change. With, with a horse, just a little bridle in his mouth, and you can completely control where you want that animal to go and, and have the dominance over him in that regard. With just that bit, the same way with a great ship. I mean, you could have these huge, massive ships, and you change course and change direction just from that little rudder, right? It's a small piece, but it's an extremely important piece, right? It's dictating the direction that that ship is going. And then it likens that to our tongues, verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know, every raging forest fire and the brush fires, and you read about these fires out in California and out in Arizona, we experienced them when we lived out there. I mean, just these massive fires. They don't start off massive. They all start off real small. They could start off as small as a cigarette butt going out a window. One piece of coal from a campfire going up into the air, falling down somewhere. That little fire can cause huge, huge. It, it sets forward that chain reaction that you just have huge destruction and devastation. And that's what the Bible is likening our tongues to. Behold how great a matter a little fire. It just takes a little fire to start off a huge chain of events. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. I mean, this is like the entire world of iniquity from one small little member that's, you know, it's about that big. There's your tongue. And capable of doing so much destruction. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. Look at this. And it is set on fire of hell. I love the language used in the King James Bible. I love the word of God. I love that God's giving us this graphic depiction because 
it ought to sound very, very severe and something that should grab your attention and go, whoa, hold on a second. Maybe I should really pay attention to this when it's using words like a world of iniquity and it's set on fire of hell. Yeah, that's meant to grab your attention, to, to give you the, the seriousness and the gravity of the situation of how much damage your tongue could really do. We need a filter on our mouths. <laughs> the Bible says, you know, that even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, can be, can be esteemed as wise. People will look at you and think, wow, that person's really smart just by not saying very much because of how many stupid things people say. And I'm no different. Look, I'm a human being. I have the same little member in my mouth. But you got to learn to apply that filter so that you don't just let everything that wants to roll off your tongue actually come out because the more you do that, the more likely you are to, to throw down a little bit of fire that's going to turn into some huge, massive, destructive flame. Now, when you can control your mouth, you can make a lot of good come out of that. Again, when you got the word of God coming out of your mouth, you're, you could be sowing that seed and reaping great benefits and great rewards and doing great work for the Lord. But on the flip side, you got to be careful with what's coming out so you're not causing destruction. Verse number seven says, For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Now, we need to be careful with these things. And I'm just going to close on this thought because when it's talking about our mouth and the tongue, it's talking about what's coming out of it, your thoughts, your ideas. This is very easily applied to social media today as well. I mean, just because you're using your fingers to type, <laughs> it's the same thing, right? You could just as well say it's coming out of your mouth, okay? And I would encourage everybody, and I don't think there's a problem with this here, but you know what? We're all human, and, and we all have the, the sinful flesh. Things get out of hand really quickly. You start getting involved in strifes and dramas and things that, that don't pertain to you, and people have this tendency to, to, for some reason, think that everybody wants to hear their opinion on everything that's going on everywhere. But you know what? That's not true. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but everybody doesn't care what you think. The vast majority of people don't. But you know what? Sometimes depending on what comes out of your mouth, then all of a sudden you start getting attention and you may end up getting unwanted attention because that in turn ends up causing a lot of extra drama. We don't, we don't need, you need to learn to, and here's what I learned to do is because I've look, I've been involved in this. I understand. I know the, the, the compelling, you know, oh man, I just want to, I just, I just need to put this on here. You're never going to win the internet. You're never going to win the debate. Okay. You start arguing online, just forget it. Okay. It's not going to happen. They never end. The debates never end. You never, you never get that last word in. Okay. You're going to be up till four in the morning. If you're going back and forth with people, it's just not going to work. And most importantly, though, I think what you need to be able to do is just take a step back before you even, if you're going to communicate, if you're going to respond, I'm not saying you just have to turn off all social media and you just can't do anything with it, but just be aware of the potential for a lot of damage and harm that can be done, especially to your testimony, to your reputation. You want to be known to have a good reputation. You want to be known as someone who's not just bringing a bunch of drama. Now, look, if drama happens because you're serving the Lord, because people are attacking you, then it is what it is. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to make it bring a, a, a you know an inaccurate representation of just all drama is just bad. But if you have the good reputation, if you have a good testimony, if you're faithfully serving the Lord, expect the attacks, expect people to lie about you, expect people to try to drag your name through the mud and slander you. That's going to happen no matter what. Okay, but you don't need to add to that. You don't need to add fuel to the fire. You don't need to correct everybody who's trying to, you know, say bad things about you. Don't get involved with them. Don't worry about it. 
You can't control what other people say, but you can control what you say. And that's what matters. Put the filter in place. Someone says something, oh man, that makes me upset. Before you hit enter, before you actually send off whatever that is, why don't you just take a few minutes and reread and think and let yourself settle down because the, the, the worst thing you could do is make emotional decisions. And that's one of the reasons why the tongue could be so dangerous. I mean, who's ever had an argument with your spouse, right? Because so e words come off so fast. I mean, way faster than even typing does, right? And how many times have you said something that you, that you regretted later? Or that caused a lot of hurt and damage? Because you ultimately said something you know you shouldn't have said. And people end up going places because they act emotionally and they let things come off their tongue without applying the, the, the sound thinking filter first and go, wait, oh, no, hold on a second. I'm not going to say that. There's no purpose for that here. It's only going to cause damage. It's only going to do harm. Nope. No reason to do that. Apply that to your mouth, but apply that also on, on your anywhere where you're, you're giving your words, putting them out there whether it be verbally or, or through text. Keep that in mind because it's going to save you from a lot of damage. Now, I like focusing on what God can do with us and what God can do for us and, and how God can use us because that's great. We see so many examples. I mean, just person after person in the Bible has done so many things for the Lord, all individual people. And so many cases, all people who came from humble beginnings, humble backgrounds, not much to offer. There's no reason why God can't use you to do great things. But let's focus on doing the good things and, and keep that inside so that we're not being foolish with our own mouth and causing end up more destruction and chaos than being used to, to build up and do all the, all the great things that God has for us to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your words. We thank you for... Blessing us and, and for everyone that's here in this church, dear Lord, I pray that you please bless this church, help this church grow. I pray that you would please add the members as you see fit, Lord, and help this body of Christ to go out and serve you and, and to reach more people, dear Lord. And I pray that you would help all of us to be able to maintain a good filter on our mouth so that we can maintain a good testimony, a good reputation, dear Lord, that, that we wouldn't... Um, allow people to be able to slander your name because of something that we do since we're claiming the name of Christ and going out and, and, and serving you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to uh, be a good reflection of who you are through our own testimony, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.